Good afternoon again. I'd like to welcome people to the second panel. We, from, I think most of you were here for the, uh, the first panel and saw a really animated discussion about where new revenues lie. And, and summarizing what was uh, probably a more in-depth panel than I can possibly summarize, there, there was a general agreement that we need to think very differently about what an opportunity is, how we need to service that opportunity, what the metrics are that we need to make a business decision on. We all, but there was also a really clear belief that we needed to know where the opportunities were that we as an industry want to prioritize before we start making technology decisions. Um, I thought it was really interesting that uh, quite a few of the carriers agreed. There were markets, vertical markets, they wanted to target. And those have one set of, of needs. That means you are going to provide a solution that has things both within your network and potentially without your network, possibly in traffic management or in healthcare or in manufacturing. And that requires one system approach. There was also a belief that there were a lot of unique capabilities of the network that could be exposed for, I'll call it the long tail, to take place. Um, the next panel is going to look at how do we take this idea of looking at the customer and the customer experience and the experience of a service and use that as our North Star for planning operations and systems. In other words, don't start with the network and say, what are we going to measure and tell the customer? We're going to start with what the customer needs to know and figure out possibly what we need to get from the network. So I'd like to welcome the second panel onto stage and ask them to take their seats. Welcome. And on this panel, we have uh, Dave Kachendel, the CTIO of ATN International, and thank him for being here. We have uh, Nolani McGadden, the VP of Strategic Accounts for the Netmore Group, and we have Kurt Minter from CSG. I want to thank the three panelists for coming here. And I think what we really want to pose is if we have new opportunities and they really need to be treated very differently, how do we need to start changing first our business and then if we want to get there, systems and processes to reflect that change? Um, who would like to start a little bit talking about the idea of injecting the idea of starting with the service, starting with the customer, not starting with the network, and some of the change that has on our, on our thinking and our planning before we even get to details. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think I'd start with the experiences that, that we have. ATN is a company that r operates many different uh, carriers in smaller regions around the world. And it needs to start from, from our perspective with um, the culture of the operations team, the sales teams, the customer service teams, to really be focusing on that customer experience from the very beginning. Um, and if that culture isn't in place, no amount of systems that you're going to add to the mix after the fact are just going to overcome for that. Overcome, overcome that. I will say though, and I think there is a, a minimum criteria that you have to have in terms of the service level you pr provide with the networks, mm -hmm. from reliability, from connectivity, from price, all of those, in order to win the right to then go compete um, through, with customer experience for, for maintaining the customer relationship long term. Nolani, would you like to pick up on that at all? Well, we have, a, at Netmore Group, we have a unique offering. A lot of our customers are network operators and solution providers. And our idea is um, providing cloud platform services so these uh, network operators can bundle those capabilities in with the existing offerings that they have. So think um, you know, providing additive IoT devices and services to an enterprise after already delivering SIM or, or broadband capabilities. So uh, you know, our uh, strategy and approach is to enable that to be streamlined, um, efficient, to meet a kind of total cost of ownership when delivering those added services to our, our customers that are network operators. Sure. So I, I would just reinforce, I think we've talked about this a lot, but this idea of customer centricity, yeah. 
um, you know, can be a couple of things. I mean, CSG has traditionally been in the business of providing, you know, quote to cash kinds of solutions. Um, and, you know, we even think about the world a little bit differently in the experience to cash. And some of our more recent transformations, you know, have started out or where we're supporting customers in a digital transformation. They think about some of the traditional BSS systems and that's kind of where the program started. But then as that program evolves or even their evaluation evolves, they start to adopt this mindset of, I really need to get the customer as the focus. So if I don't understand the customer, if I don't figure out a way to capitalize on all this great data that I have to truly understand what that customer wants so I can deliver a very highly personalized service to them and drive more consumption. If I don't do all that really well, the fact that I can quote it and I can order it and I can bill it accurately isn't going to help me grow my business. So they're actually almost in real time coming to the conclusion that, okay, this is all important, but if I don't add that experience piece of it to the way that I'm thinking about my digital transformation and put the customer at the very center of everything, I may not be able to you know, do what I need to do and, and really get the return on investment that I'm looking for and the competitive um, advantage that I want to have again in the marketplace. Do you believe that the new services that we just talked about on the last panel, where, you know, for example, there are totally non-telecom components to the end-to-end -end customer experience, which actually plays to some of the things you were talking about, right? Is that you bring uh, infrastructure to go beyond just the telco. Uh, do you think that is something that we can support with the processes as they are today? Or what would be maybe, you know, your top few changes that we need to make? So I would say, I mean, it depends where you are um, in your business journey that, mm -hmm. down that path, but certainly the traditional uh, methodologies, modes of selling, connectivity, I think particularly in the B2B case that we were talking mm -hmm. about at the end there, um, you have to really transform the entire business in order to move right. beyond that uh, and to be able to sell uh, services, be they security services, cloud services, managed networks, on-premise for your customers, those sorts of things. It's a I wouldn't say it's necessarily a different sales force, but it's a very different sales motion right. than it is to just sell pure connectivity. And I think that's, again, a really critical part of that transformation. You need to reorient your, your business around that. And that's something that, that we've been doing in our international group. So we have a, an overlay organization that is responsible for the B2B sales activities, and they lead with all of those value-added services. And connectivity flows behind that to support them. And, and, and I think one of the things to consider is, you know, there's been a lot of investment in customer experience when you think about just the simple business to consumer markets. So I've got a cell phone, I'm on whatever carrier, you know, they're the pretty straightforward. But when you start thinking about some of these other models and you start introducing an ecosystem, so that your question was really around, do you, is what's in place really fit for purpose? Well, sometimes it is and sometimes it not. it's not, but where it really is going to start to break is where you have to serve the complexities of large enterprises, right? Um, and you also introduce this value chain, right? So it becomes about an orchestration of an ecosystem that maybe relies on connectivity as one piece of it, but there may be one, two, three, four service providers in the mix ultimately delivering a bundled service to an end customer. And all of that has to be done correctly and all that orchestration has to be done efficiently and effectively. And if any one of those pieces breaks, it's gonna affect the customer experience and you're gonna have a problem. So I think that that complexity of B2B versus B2C and the introduction of this concept of ecosystems and partnerships um, you know, puts us in a situation where there's gotta be a lot of investment and those systems to do that efficiently don't really exist in most of the telcos today. If, if I could just you know, pick up on what you were saying, Kurt. I mean, part of what I see here is that in the past we've had, as an industry, a fairly small number of services that we knew very well, we defined, we marketed well, we branded, we differentiated, we understood our competitors, and we knew what we needed to tell customers when things went poorly and things went well. We're moving into a new area, era where in addition to that, if we want to grow our businesses bigger, not just continue to do well in the old businesses, we're now talking not your cell phone service is good, dropped calls, throughput, et cetera. We're going to be talking healthcare outcomes. 
or for those who were here earlier, you know, the efficacy of instrumentation and the ability of consumers to interact with race cars at Formula One, or optimizing a set of, of racing boats. You certainly need to talk the industry's language, but I suspect the end-to-end -end experience has a lot more than the network in it. And somehow, somewhere, someone needs to have that dependency graph and, and an understanding of, you're right. You didn't get that data from the race car. Oh, by the way, it's not the network, but it's this other thing. Because at the end of the day, the fact that it wasn't the network doesn't make it OK. I mean, we still lost the race. I mean, I think, I think Cal was talking about this when he talked about, you know, yeah. you have to have those focus areas, those vertical focus yeah. areas in B2B in order to be able to justify the right of claiming the additional revenue. So you want to claim that revenue, you need to be the one who is orchestrating the solution yeah. for, the, for that business customer. That means you have to have the expertise, not just with the technology components that make it up, but also with the vertical space where you're going to be deploying that in. Um, and I think that's really what the big transformation in customer experience for B2B is. Um, it's not, you know, a digital you know, app on your phone or something like that. It's not even the interaction on a day-to-day -day basis. It's how you're going to drive value outcomes for them um, and be the, you know, be the general contractor who is the expert in that space that can actually deliver a solution. Right. And imagine trying to contain so many different verticals of expertise, healthcare, business operations, venues, um, cities, lights, pedestrians, you know, it becomes very, very all-encompassing. And, either, you know, I, I work a lot with the tier two wireless carriers. They don't have the capability to drive customer service organizations to be experts in every single one of those. So they have to rely on partnerships. They have to rely on very strong um, ecosystems that have some level of consistency so that they can drive kind of a baseline of knowledge uh, and really that table stakes, you know, if they come to the table that they're enabling uh, a core value of a strong carrier grade network, then they have proven the right to deliver some of those other services to that customer. Yeah, and to your point, there could be a big difference between how a tier one and a tier two operator approaches this problem. Right? A TELUS or a T-Mobile may have the ability to say, we're going to pick some, some winners. A uh, second tier in a smaller area, particularly a regional one that has to you know, collaborate with its peers, may not have that luxury. The common thing that all the carriers have, right, that I think is really important and central to all of this is they have the data, right? Yes. What they choose to do with it or what application is being used on their network, that they, they're sitting on massive amounts of very valuable data. And in some cases, maybe they want to wrap some services around it. In some cases, they don't. But it's not just about the connectivity. It's about the intelligence that can be mined out of the data that the telcos have that can inform whether it's what services this customer is going to want next, how they want to consume it, those sorts of things. You know, so, so telcos are in, a, I think, a, a really good position. Like, who knows more about you than your, than your cell phone provider, right? Maybe, my, maybe uh, uh, Amazon, because they listen to me all the time. But uh, you know, the, the, the data that, that they have on you based on your usage and the apps and, and everything that you do from a telco perspective, I think is a really, really valuable asset that the telcos can take advantage of. I definitely think from, a, a, again, a B2B perspective, I think that if you can mine that, that data, and I feel at least in many of our markets, we're just beginning to look at that as an opportunity to identify what the customer needs and then be able to provide those services to them. Because I mean, I think that's really what the value proposition of that data is operationally, you know, to change the, the value proposition to increase the revenue share associated with it is to know what the customer needs to anticipate that and then to be able to provide that to them. And that data does exist if you can mine it and if you can coordinate it and you can action it, then you can actually be, be effective there. But that's, to me, I think, you know, again, for the journey that we're on, that's still a, a forward-looking part of our journey. So it's, it's not, a, not a gimme. Well, it, it seems that both leveraging the data like you're, like you're advocating and getting into more complicated end-to-end -end services and, and verticals are all things that go beyond um, the scope of our current operations and mindset. And you know, talking out of school, we had a really interesting discussion before we came on stage about I think everyone would like to have purpose-built systems that can allow us to look forward. 
and yet we realize that there is a huge revenue stream and a huge infrastructure and trained human beings and organizational structures built around the services we have. So you've got this, do we put in new or do we augment the existing and maybe talk a little bit about efficient ways to go forward, embrace the future and not, well, frankly, crater the past? Yes, I definitely think from my perspective, you have to be pragmatic about that process. So you can't throw everything, I think we were talking about this in the last panel as well, you can't yep can't start from, from, from scratch. You have to take what you have and then identify how you can start to add capabilities on top of that and make migrations. I think those migrations in what, what we were just talking about in B2B, I think that's a, that's a maybe a pretty straightforward add-on capability. Mm -hmm. You're layering services that are not really core telco services mm -hmm. always on top of that offering and that, that's a pretty straightforward pathway. Um, however, it does mean that you need to transform your organization in order to provide that. And so that's part of that process, I think, on how, how you're leading um, to that end state is that is part of the transformation. And then ultimately, that leads to a transformation of the systems that support, support that as well. I mean, it seems to me that Netmore's value proposition to a degree is doing that very augmentation without disrupting the basics, right? Yeah, it's, uh, uh, it is an overlay network. It does kind of, um, test the boundaries a lot of network operators who are focused on licensed cellular as their protocol for tele for communications and uh, you know Laura Wan is the protocol that we stand behind and it is specifically geared towards long-range battery optimization of devices and um, you know 5g has come very far in the last couple of years but you know three four years ago you couldn't find a device ecosystem that would allow you to have um, you know tracking mail that was delivered um, humidity temperature building you know covid particulates in this room these are devices that are now available on the network but they are they need to be um, securely provisioned securely tracked and Wi-Fi is typically not the right approach. And 5G is coming there, but LoRaWAN has really taken a very large segment of that market. But that means you have to think about other infrastructure. It doesn't mean you can't, as a network operator, take advantage of um, the natural things that you are strong in, um, whether it's towers, leases, services, bucket trucks, all of those kinds of things can be reused, but it's not necessarily the communication infrastructure that you have in place. Um, I, I think, um, Grant, for me, it, it, it kind of goes back uh, all of this. In, in some cases, you, you don't necessarily have to replace everything. Right. But you know, technology for technology's sake or a network for network's sake is, is not getting us where, where we need to be. I think the, the key is trying to ensure that you understand what is the problem that I'm trying to solve for, right? Whether I'm servicing a big excuse me, a business or a consumer, what need do they have that's currently unmet and what experience are they looking to, to uh, get consumed from me? And then how do I utilize my unique assets, my, my unique differentiated capabilities uh, to deliver that? And that in some cases that may be direct, in some cases that may be uh, with partners. But you know what we're typically always looking for is you know getting back to that use case right what is that need that's being unmet and unmet and and how can we kind of build from the core infrastructure that exists potentially and augment that in a way that allows us to deliver something that is more valuable to the consumer. Sometimes you may have to start from scratch, but most times it's more of a transformative process where you can mitigate a lot of that risk. But I think Again, that my, my kind of key thinking there is, is just keeping that mindset of customer being the central position here and making sure you don't lose track of, you know, I've got some really, really cool widgets to work from. I've got SaaS, I've got cloud, I've got AI, Gen AI, I've got all these cool things that I can do, but it's really about understanding what the customer needs and how I can apply those capabilities in a differentiated way to, to solve the problems and, and provide the service that they're looking for. 
I'd even go so far as to say if you don't do that in that order, keep the customer's need first, when you deploy those technologies, you will frustrate your customer. You will not actually meet their needs and you will drive them away from you. So I think that's, that's part of the challenge that as technologists we sometimes face is we, we see the opportunity in front of us from the technology, but if we, if we focus on that to the exclusion of what the value is to the end customer, be that the consumer or the business, then it, it won't actually achieve anything. It will detract value from our organizations and it will drive our customers away. Just, uh, just one of the things that we've talked about at CSG a little bit lately is this idea, right? You, you talk about unforgettable customer experiences, right? That are being driven in all kinds of industries. And, and for telcos, we're sometimes thinking, well, we, we, these we actually want to deliver forgettable, right? Like it, it didn't even happen. It was so seamless, I didn't even notice that anything really happened. So this idea of you know, forgettable customer experience um, or you know, forgettable experiences, you know, in some cases, is, is the best thing. We talked about the quote earlier that any, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. We need to make this look like magic. Um, one of the things I was thinking is we're talking about more and more uh, services that may be defined within the company but may be also defined without or outside of the company. And this to me uh, starts looking like a lot of what the, I'm going to be at the MEF in a couple of weeks. And the MEF has this new Network as a Service initiative where they're looking at how do, first of all, communication services providers interact efficiently, for example, to deal with a digital supply chain for building an airplane that's, that's global, right? No, no North American carrier can, can service that. No Asian carrier can service that. No, no European carrier can service that. It's going to take uh, an assembly put together. So they're looking at, for example, carrier-to-carrier -carrier, uh, interfaces and what it takes to transmit customer experience data on it. So service assurance, SLA data, be able to monitor it, be able to bring that right into an end-to-end -end dashboard. They were also looking at what are the metrics that you need to be able to make some of the Kamara APIs cost-effective. Right? You need to suddenly translate a lot of our, translate our technology to someone who's in he a healthcare worker, uh, not worker, but a healthcare expert, building IT systems, or maybe someone in municipal or, or state government. Um, what are some of the, the system and process changes that you see that will make those possible? This is going to be huge numbers, potentially, of transactions consumed by machines, not necessarily by human beings saying, I bought a new phone. Um, they want to be able to integrate that seamlessly. Magic. It sounds like magic to me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, again, these, these things are all, all journeys that we need to go, go down. Um, orienting around an API-driven infrastructure rather than a yeah. UI-driven infrastructure or a pick up the phone and talk to somebody right. to place an order infrastructure is part of that transform transformative process. Complying with standard APIs that are common across the industry is very important as part of that. Holding our vendors accountable to that as well are all parts of moving and orienting down that pathway. Um, you know, I, I certainly, and I think that there's, you know, if we look globally at the different tier one, tier two, tier three operators around the world, there's a very large set of differences between the way that those telcos are operating their businesses in those different regions. Um, but starting with the principles of how to build resilient systems, well described, documented through API systems, is, is something that can help drive the industry down that, down that path and start broadening that out. Um, to, to meet those kinds of needs. And those needs, and I think one of the things that we think about you know, as we can kind of look at the, the broad global market is, is that um, we are in a unique position in that as tier twos or tier threes in, in, in the markets, in, in, in tier ones in small markets, but mm -hmm. um, we get the opportunity to look at what the global major players are doing and identify the quickest path to the points where that they've explored before us. Um, so we talk about the North Star, so you don't like go to the North Star, you tack to the North Star if you're a sailor. So we get the opportunity to take that shortcut following right. in the wake, as it were, of where they're actually going. So you're seeing some best practices. 
Absolutely. Best practices of both what to do and what not to do, and, you know, from what's been left behind on the side. Want to share a few? <laughs> I, n no personal stories, no. Yeah. But, um, but, I, but I do think that um, from, uh, from our perspective, um, it's important to be a fast follower down that pathway. Right. Um, when we have conversations, and I think you know, everyone's been talking about AI and the application of AI, I think you know, we need to have concrete discussions about what that means and how that impacts the customer experience, um, what the foundational elements are that drive a good customer experience there. And I think there's a lot of risk in jumping down those pathways too quickly, too early without the foundation being set. In that particular case, it's having really, really good customer data that's consistent, that's coherent, that's the same for all of your, you know, same metrics for all your customers that you can use to feed AI engines. And if you jumped ahead, and we saw a lot of people doing this, you end up with really bad customer experiences where they want to disconnect because you've convinced them or you've sold them plans on your AI agent that don't exist or what, what have you. Um, so I think those are some of the examples of being pe kind of measured in terms of how you're doing that, orienting around the value to the customer, not the shiny technology object. Yeah, well, I was going to say, ahead. one of the things, you know, you, you talk about kind of, well, how do we make sure we all get this right? <clears throat> and one of the things that we see, you know, at, at CSG in our day-to-day -day basis, how we think, we, we think about the world from a very customer-centric perspective. But it doesn't, it doesn't mean that the engineering behind things isn't super important. Right. And standards compliance is becoming more and more important as you start to talk about, you know, the different kinds of networks. Obviously, the, the, the uh, carriers, the operators have been dealing with standards with the different, uh, you know, variations of, of wireless. But when we think about how our backend systems are now going to communicate through, you know, like TM Forum compliant APIs, you know, a few years ago or, you know, five years ago, uh, you know, that wasn't kind of table stakes. Now when, when our carrier operator uh, customers are looking to do, you know, any kind of a big project, standards compliance is really, really important for them because they don't necessarily know what might be the future or where they're going to have to go. They just need to know that they have to have the agility to be able to plug and play, whether that's giving a third party access to their network or bundling a third party service into their catalog so they can offer some bundles. If there aren't standards uh, based kind of rules of engagement so we can all play well together in the sandbox, it becomes a real nightmare. So I've seen the importance of some of those, those standards and our participation and carrier participations and things like TM Forum or MEF uh, becoming you know, really important because complexity and the, the, the ecosystem that needs to be able to play in that sandbox is a lot bigger than just the network operators now. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up, Kurt, because that I think is one of the core um, success factors that we have at Netmore is that you know we are a LoRaWAN standard and we can enable, as you mentioned, Grant, the ability to take devices, you know, with, with some small changes to go across multiple countries. Uh, and you know, Netmore Group um, th that acquired Senate is from that, that Dave and I came from. Uh, we were, you know, predominantly a U.S.-based company, and now Netmore has brought 11 other countries throughout Europe into their total offering. Um, so the LoRaWAN standard allows you to get quicker time to market. You can find devices, whether they're manufactured in France, Germany, Czech, and use them in the U.S. and vice versa. Now that gives carriers and cities and venues extreme buying power because oh, I don't like this device, let me go to this one. You know, I need to be able to deploy across multiple ports uh, of call in European and US ports, I can get a device that can handle that. And, and standards enable that kind of quicker time to market and more choices uh, for the network operators when they think about bundling these solutions together. I have to just Please. geek out on the standard thing for one little bit. Um, so. Um, What's important, we're in the middle of doing some of these integrations right now with TM Forum based uh, APIs. Um, what's super important, there's a maturity process that standards go through and we're again on a pathway there as, an or, as a, a group of organizations. Um, what's really important is that you can, as an operator implementing, is that I can go and say yes, you're compliant and that means that it works with the other vendor. And that's not always the case today. So when there's optionality in the standards, that mm -hmm. then starts to de de 
degrade the, the value associated with them. So as participants from the industry, we need to be pushing the standards bodies and then the implementers to make sure that they are fully compliant in a way that is plug and play as it were capable going forward. So I think that's, that's a really important part of that. And until we get to that vision from a standards perspective, mm -hmm. kind of the grand visions of interconnecting, you know, the entire world together through APIs is, is you know, going to be hard. Well, sure. I mean, if you think of, you know, any kind of a global or a pan-regional industry that then wants to use communication components in its service, they, won't, they don't want to hear that you can do this in North America but not in Europe, or you can do it in Germany and France but not in the UK. That's, that's not going to work for them, right? So I, I do agree with that very much. Um, the, the other thing that I think we really need to think about is if we want to expose services to our customers, and we want our customers to appreciate these in terms they understand, it's going to be SLA type parameters. It's not going to be arcane configuration settings that as an industry we've known and loved. And that says to me, if we're going to expose APIs and we expect to make money on APIs or we want to use them ourselves in targeted industries that we're going to dominate and, and be very successful in, that means we, start to, we need to start to design and measure our own network internally as a service with APIs. So that when you go to your broadband access or you go to your RAN, you're looking for a service. And suddenly that will, I believe, and you know, Kurt's the expert in this, but that will now talk parameters that customer experience systems can natively understand, reducing a lot of systems and integration costs and, and increasing agility. Or am I wrong? No, I, I, I think that's, that's exactly right. And, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of that interoperability and everything becoming much more real time, right? So right. lag in data, lag in synchronization among systems, that, that's not acceptable anymore. I have to have everything, you know, as, you know, on demand, right? So, so everything being real time, I think, is another you know trend that drives a lot of different kinds of of requirements. Uh, you know, even if I'm logging onto a network and I'm I'm on my gaming device, um, you know, nice to be able to to have some kind of differentiation where my quality of service is uh, is is the best that it can be when I'm I'm doing that versus you know maybe some other kind of activity. So there's there's uh, you know all kinds of use cases that, that could drive different requirements. This is maybe a little bit of a tangent, but to kind of bring it back to the customer experience, you know, on a B two C gamer kind of environment, something like that. I think it, it highlights as well again the the need to deliver more than just the connectivity service to the front door. Mm -hmm. um, in many cases, the bandwidth that we're providing from a broadband perspective, the front door is plenty fine to handle that, that gamer without a whole lot of quality of service. But whatever's happening inside the MDU or inside the house, inside the, the business, that's really where, again, in order for us to deliver the service that we are trying to deliver to the customer, which isn't a feed, um, we need to go beyond the, the entryway, beyond the CPE, and to really bring the service end to end inside that customer facility. So I think that's part of thinking about that customer experience and, and why it's natural for the, the CSP to want to grow beyond just the connectivity piece to that. It's because it really is how the value of the service ultimately is delivered. So you, you've just brought up a point. I was doing some primary research recently and was talking to a couple of uh, fixed, fixed broadband operators. I realize we're at you know, the mobile show, but the same problem exists where they were trying to get beyond just selling, you know, 200 megabit uh, broadband to residences and SMBs, and they were putting managed router, Wi-Fi, mesh gateways into both businesses and homes, and managing all the way to known ends of streams. So TVs, were you going to get a pixelated experience, et cetera, et cetera. Games, were you going to get a good experience? And they were the problem was, initially, systems they had had no idea of customer premises equipment. It had no idea of cloud-managed Wi-Fi mesh, even though the carrier wanted to deploy that. So these were difficult transitions. Uh, you want to comment a little bit on, on strategies? Because we don't want our technology to hold us back 
from expanding our revenue base and giving a better customer experience. Yeah, I, I think w one of the things that, that we think about, like in, in the old world, even before wireless, right? You know, you had these models where, you know, it was a cable, you had coax running to your right. house. So it was homes past. So ultimately this idea of, you know, here's a connectivity service or a broadband service, you know, to your door, and I don't know anything more about you. You know, where, where we've seen an evolution and what we've done with our products and, and you know, the, the enablement of a better customer experience is, is really being able to understand. So break down that household, right? What happens in the household? Who lives in the household? And the same thing applies to a small business, right? Uh, it's, it's who lives there. It's it, what devices exist in that. You know, what services do those individual customers uh, consume? What are their priorities? So being able to have that visibility and that granular view of the customer, right, in, in whatever fashion that means, what, you know, devices, preferences, all those sorts of things, um, allows you to, you know, and it, it was in the beginning more about, well, how can I bundle services in a way that's gonna be compelling for them? But, but now I think that the technology has evolved. So, you know, knowing all of that detail about the customer can actually allow you to do some pretty unique and creative things with not just how you bundle, you know, a generic service, but how you can optimize that service and maybe provide, you know, a different kind of service with different sorts of SLAs and things into that household, depending on, you know, what device is consuming it, all of those. So getting down to that hyper personalization, whether it's for a consumer, a household, or small business, or even large businesses, is, is sort of the, the key in understanding that at that level of detail to, uh, to again, allow that personalization and in, in, in driving what they really want to consume and how they want to consume it. I, I think also, certainly in the, the, the B2C side, making sure you have a platform that you can engage with the customer on that isn't a um, troubleshooting environment. So you need to make sure that you have a platform that you can engage with them to provide, the provide them the opportunity to take advantage of these services without calling up because something's wrong and having that be in the engagement point. Um, we say, you know, once you've called us, we have failed at that point. So our customer experience is not good. And so we need those other tools as part of the customer experience that are more valuable to them than us just using it as a, a vehicle to sell services, but to provide real value to them, whether that's how their bundled um, video services are delivered or what have you, things along those lines. I will say, even though we are at Mobile World Congress, there's a lot of, certainly a lot of our businesses that are both fixed broadband and wireless to the same customer yes. base. And I think that's, you see some of those trends happening even here where there's a lot of interest in that combination. Um, and I think the customer expectation is, is that the service is connectivity. It's the services that are being delivered on top of that. And they don't care whether that's from a broadband pipe or 5G um, here, here in Vegas. So I think that's part of the, the challenge and the opportunity is to find ways of making that, yes, just connect. Yeah. And I think there's also a paradigm shift between what is it that I'm connecting? Uh, I heard uh, Daniel in the last session, he mentioned that T-Mobile has 140 million you know, wireless subscribers. Well, there are 285 million households that take water into their homes and we are delivering as part of the services to our network operators, the ability to track and understand how much water is being used in, a, in an apartment, multi-dwelling unit, single family units. Um, are there any leaks that are happening? Gas leaks, you know, is your water heater working fine? And these are services that have you know, just started to come in the market in the last five to 10 years. And now they're certainly another area that telecommunications providers can consider servicing and, and providing that connectivity to. We're coming, not at the end of the, the session, but we're coming to the end where it would be, I think, useful to all of us summarize this a little bit for the audience and get out the connecting of the dots that any of us would like to. I'd like to just focus on a few points that I think have been themes, interestingly, not just through this panel, but mirrored in the, in the previous panel. And the first is we need to start with the customer, not with the network and the technology. And that may break some of the structures that we've built into our CX systems and business processes in the past. Uh, a second theme that's been very, very consistent is we're likely, at least new money, growth revenue, 
is not coming from people. It's coming from things. They may be expensive, sophisticated things like race cars and sailboats. They may be the cheapest, most numerous things like gas detectors and water sensors. And a third theme is that they are intrinsically part of other industries that we don't understand yet, which means we need to either understand those industries, some of them, and bake that in understanding into both our people and our software systems, or in some other cases, we need to make our data and our services really, really easy to consume um, by others. And then, you know, Kurt made, uh, I think, a great point. We had a really interesting discussion earlier that, you know, this is a big transformation. We can't expect that we're going to put shiny new systems in for everything. But we can start possibly putting in shiny new systems for the growth revenue and then slowly possibly backward integrate that. These are sort of the trends that I've, that I've sort of seen the, the team talk about here. Um, but would we like to go down the panel and is there like a, a summary remark you'd like to make about how are we going to earn these new revenues using customer experience as our North Star? Sure. It's interesting to me that 10 years ago I was talking to network operators about the need to bundle services in order for you to make customers sticky, to think about creating wealth and other revenue streams. And I'm still kind of evangelizing that same message here today. I think there has certainly been um, struggles in the ability to kind of translate connectivity value across different ecosystems. Uh, but my, my message there would be there are partnerships that enable a shorter time to market and there's standards uh, and capabilities that al allow, allow these network operators to take advantage of that and, and drive a, a quicker ROI. I think that, uh, I mean, we, we can't lose sight of the, and it was mentioned in the last panel as well, of the investments that we're putting into the physical infrastructure and that we have to keep on putting into the physical infrastructure. That's not going to stop. It's going to just continue. Right. And to, to me and to, I think, to, to ATN, as we think about the, the space, we recognize as well that it's it's not enormous population growth that's going to be driving our you know our, our our top line revenue or stealing a whole lot of market share from from competitors and fairly uh, mature markets. It ha it has to be adding value service valued services and that starts with the customer experience whether that's. Um, you know, bundling services for convenience for consumers, whether that's adding capabilities of managing the networks in their houses and doing adding security services, or leveraging on B2B um, uh, solutions that are vertical specific and highly valued in those industries. Those are very clearly the way that we can help monetize those assets that we have to keep on investing in. Um, and I think it's 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 part of. Um, our responsibility, effectively, as we as we you know as we as we look at those investments, that we have to go down those paths, and it starts with that customer experience and the and the customer journey that we go down them with. Kurt, would you like to uh, summarize for us? Yeah, I just I think one one thing that you know we haven't talked about a lot, but but is very relevant to to this is, you know, the idea of you know doing things you know in a, in a pragmatic way ensuring that you're addressing you know kind of a known customer need um, and and also a shift in perspective with customer at the center one of the things that we see out there that's been a little bit of a trap is a lot of the operators spend you know so much of their time and money in the acquisition phase so marketing to new customers how do I how do I get basically how do I promote churn off of my competitors so that I can get and, and it's just a it's a it's a battle right but a, a change in perspective from that's important but where is the real opportunity to drive top line revenue growth for companies it's within that customer base so think about making more investments in you know that post acquisition experience are you treating are you are you basically tapping into all the data that you have are you really understanding what that post acquisition customer journey looks like because there's a lot of insights that can be 
uh, derived from you know how that customer is engaging with you, how that customer is utilizing your service that will tell you, if you're listening, how you can add on the next thing that's going to add value to their lives and add on the next thing and the next thing, whether that's a consumer market or a business market. So really focusing on that kind of that post acquisition kind of customer experience, understanding what, what they're doing, the preferences that they have to, to really inform where you make your investments and really, you know, how you might want to think about making those investments into areas where you're really capitalizing on the, the customer base that you have versus having a, maybe too much focus on, you know, acquiring or stealing a, a customer from, you know, your competitor down the street. Can I just add on one, one piece? Because sure. I think it's very similar is I think we do the same thing with technology where we acquire technology without a customer story behind it. Um, we had the panel on before talking about 5G and what were gonna be the use cases and you know question marks around consumer and we have some B2B ones that are in, in, uh, in proof of concept right now that seem very attractive. I think it's, that's part of the, the, the challenge for us as well is to not just identify technology that can be transformative, it, in the customer's you know journey, but also how we orient the organizations to take advantage of that and bring that as part of the, the service delivery instead of just launching the service to see what happens, but actually make sure that we have the customers demanding that as well. Well, I want to bring this to a little bit of a close, though I think we could continue on this for a while because I'm seeing more themes coming up. Um, but I want to give a final thanks once again to the panelists. Uh, Dave Kendall from ATN, uh, Nolani McGadden from Netmore, and of course, current, mit current mentor um, from CSG. And thank you very much for spending your time sharing your experience.